Hello and welcome back to my podcast called Faith is Strength. I'm Nochi Mendel. I'm speaking out of Muncie, New York, and I'm helping spread the beautiful light of spiritual living across the world. The date of this recording is January 7th of 2019. May my words and the expressions of my soul be gratifying to everyone who hears them. I pray that my ideas help pave a beautiful path in your journey of life. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for existing. The title of today's podcast is called A Breath of Fresh Outlook. This title is going to have multiple parts as it is an ongoing topic. In this sub-series, we are going to explore business. We are going to explore what it entails to be an entrepreneur. We're going to explore things like decision-making, motivation and excelling, outlook, time well spent, health, determinism, patience, some philosophy regarding rich people, and finally we'll summarize. The length at which business, making money, and just overall wealth tie into spiritual living is greater than most people think. Making a living is an aspect of life that takes up so much of our attention. Oftentimes, and for most people, it takes up more attention than perhaps a spouse. I mean, this is a force to reckon with. This is not just something that, oh, we have to do, so therefore we'll do it. This is something that we spend most of our life doing. So by no means can it be overlooked. And with any which way you look at it, business and career must overlap and be interwoven within your spiritual framework, within your spiritual makeup. This podcast is going to explore the very fabric that makes up those interlocking, those interconnecting, those paths that cross where spirituality meets business. Not that it has to. Trust me, I can record and talk about business in its own right. It is very deserving. But I don't want to leave spirituality out of the picture because I think proper entrepreneuring requires a healthy dose of spiritual living, of spiritual outlook for both guidance, motivation, and understanding. This is part one. I'm going to start my introduction by placing a mirror in front of myself and looking at me, looking at my soul, looking at my life. I'm a father, a businessman, and a spiritual practitioner. At 26 years young, I'm about as motivated as it gets. I currently hold partnerships in, run, and manage more than a handful of businesses, which I like to refer to as baskets. Aside from those small numbers, I have a blog, a learning schedule, family time, I take care of my health, right? So I'm busy with all that life entails. But looking backwards, when I was 16, where was I? I was sitting in the car with my friend smoking weed from sunup till sundown, or rather should I say from sundown until sundown. I knew nothing about business, nor was I interested in business. I did what I had to do to get the next dub, to get high. Yo, let's get high, right? <laughs> All day, but that's about it. I don't come from a rich, business-oriented type of family or background. Business did not appeal to me at all growing up. I dropped out of school after ninth grade, hung on the streets with my friends and did what I wanted, exposed to all kinds of stimuli and, quote, freedom. So I think about all of that and I look at myself and I ask myself, how did I go from that to where I am now? How did I transition from being an average teenager to a young entrepreneur in less than five or seven years? I wonder to myself, what motivates me? 
I ask myself, what drives me? What pushes me? How do I manage it all? And my hopes are that through relaying my journey, I will be able to help you understand the answers to those questions, and perhaps it can help you succeed in all your business endeavors. Right? Because let's think about this for a sec. I'm not a one percenter. I'm not a millionaire. Some people look at this and say, you can't talk about business success, being an entrepreneur, because you haven't made it yet, which we're going to get to all of that, right? We're going to get to all of that logic. I see the picture in reverse. The fact that I've been on this journey for so many years and I haven't given up, I haven't lost heart, I haven't lost focus, I know where I'm going, gives me every right and incentive to talk about the life, the struggle, the process not the other way around. I'm sick of hearing from the successful. I wanna hear from those who are in the rut. I wanna to talk to those who are currently struggling to get there, not those who have gotten there. It's always easy to look back and retrospect and say, I worked hard, you have to do this, you have to do that. What about those who are in the process? willing to share and talk about it, whether they ever make it, whatever that means or not. That's where I stand. I'm ready to share whether I make it or not. Most of what I'm about to share isn't incumbent upon my success. It holds true whether I succeed or not. I could fall victim to half the things that I relay right now myself, despite knowing it so well and sharing it. I'm no angel. I'm human. We're all human. I believe that understanding how I transitioned from who I was to who I have become is the key to understanding how any successful entrepreneur got to where they are. If you carefully listen to each sentence that I utter and understand that each point has sweat and deep underlying principles behind it, then you'll be able to use them as tools to help you grow within your business or venture as well. Guaranteed. There are multiple reasons why I've decided to record this podcast, this episode, or this mini-series. But one of the main reasons is because I really think it's necessary for people to understand that being an entrepreneur doesn't mean that you've already made it, if there is such a thing. And if you do believe that there's such a thing, then you should be able to achieve it in a very short amount of time. It's merely a mindset backed by specific practices, principles, and outlooks. Being an entrepreneur is its own entity. You can be an entrepreneur long before you make the big bucks. I haven't reached the big bucks, yet I'm still an entrepreneur. Does that mean that I can't now record this episode about entrepreneuring? Absolutely not. This is actually one of the reasons why I'm recording. If I record an episode when I'm already a millionaire, then what sets me apart from all the other thousands of books on the shelf? Besides, isn't it time that we start hearing from the people who are currently going through the struggle? The publishing of this podcast is a living proof of every sentence I utter therein. You do not have to be Donald Trump to write about success. You do not need to have a billion dollars to talk about entrepreneuring. Originally, I was going to write a little short book with this title. And when I told my mother about it, she said, she thinks I should make a blog out of it because it's ongoing and not a finished product. I said, that's a great point. Entrepreneuring is a journey. There's no finished product. That is one of the main points that I want to drive home today. Let me ask you, when does it become a finished product? When your business makes $10 million a year? When your personal income is $50 million annually? There's no biting point. Being an entrepreneur is not dependent on how much money you make or if the business has reached its peak, again, whatever that means. Listen on as I go over the most important aspects of being and becoming an entrepreneur. I'm certain that everyone, regardless of their current position in the business world, can only benefit by the ideas in this series. Now, to get started, one of the, one of the big questions that are out there that you may have heard is, is an entrepreneur 
made or is an entrepreneur born? Are they made or born? All right, so from my perspective, not every businessman is an entrepreneur. Neither is every millionaire or rich person an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur is a breed of its own, which begs the good old question, are entrepreneurs made or are they born? In other words, is possessing the qualities that you need in order to be an entrepreneur something that is natural or is it something that you learn? Is it in your DNA or can you follow a set of rules and be guaranteed to succeed? I think these are all very important questions and by well understanding the answers, you will know which route you must take and which tools you must use in order to succeed. In my opinion, entrepreneurs are born, but they can be made as well. The latter having to put in a lot more work than the former. Not physically though, but mentally. The qualities that come naturally to the born entrepreneur will take a lot more effort to attain by the individual who is not born with it. But it is doable. Back to me for a sec. Forget about my teenage life and all the bad things that I did to my health, body, mind, and soul. Let me jump right into my working days. At 17 years old, I felt the need to get my life together. So I got myself my first job. I was hired into a warehouse position for picking orders. The employer was called Prime Supply, and they are a building and maintenance supply company located in Newark, New Jersey. They had thousands of products that were uniquely identified by their custom SKU system, and I rolled around on a crown picking machine putting orders together. All right, my day began at 6 a.m., having to wake up and get ready. I lived in Muncie, which is about 40 to 60 minute drive to Newark, New Jersey, depending on the time of the day. The doors opened at 7.30 a.m. My days were filled with heavy lifting. We're talking cement bags, paint buckets, tiles, packaging, then wrapping the orders on pallets. It was a simple job that required great physical strength and clarity. As time went on, I started memorizing the items by their name and skew. By the time I left that job, I knew thousands of SKUs by heart. But that wasn't enough for me. The schedule was great discipline, and it helped me stop smoking weed and cigarettes, but there was still something inside of me that felt the natural need to excel even further. There was a lion, an uh, animal roaring inside of me. So where did I turn to? Jim. My 6 a.m. morning call quickly turned into a 4.30 a.m. morning call. At 18 years old, I was walking into gym at 5 a.m. I was in Newark at 7.30 a.m. and back home between 6.30 and 9 p.m., only to go to sleep and do it again. Physical health and fitness is motivating in its own right, and now that I felt good, my mind was automatically feeding for more goodness. If working in a very physical environment and going to gym every morning wasn't enough, I started doing sets of push-ups and pull-ups periodically throughout the day. One set led to two, and two led to three, and so on. A couple months in, I was doing four sets of push-ups a day and three sets of pull-ups. I was doing 130 to 150 push-ups per set and 20 to 30 pull-ups per set. I was a machine, a beast. So if you're wondering why I'm mentioning these details, Stay tuned, there's a reason, and you'll begin to notice the pattern. You know, how, how did I get from talking about business to talking about working out? I'm gonna get there. With that kind of self-discipline and motivation, I was destined to succeed far beyond my imagination. Because remember, I'm a young guy. I'm 17, 18, 19, I don't, I don't know nothing about life. So, there's a potential, there, there's something that I'm building way beyond my imagination at that point. This is obviously in retrospect. Looking back, I see that now. I didn't know that then. In fact, I still was not into business at all. I had no thoughts of business other than doing my job and getting my paycheck. I was, nonetheless, great at my job. And within one year, I became the fastest picker in that warehouse. And from there, I quickly became the warehouse manager. And in a matter of 1.5 years that I worked there, I got to the position where I managed the whole warehouse, including shipping, receiving, ordering, and a crew of 15 guys. Keep in mind that I was 19, and everyone under my wing was older than me, some of them by 30 years or more. 
So within this one to two to three year period that I worked there, I had quickly excelled from being just a simple picker, right? I was the guy that they let in. And next thing you know, I'm managing the whole warehouse. So as things turned out from there was that I got engaged to a girl that I was dating. And at 19 years old, I had my wedding date set. At this point, I had worked at Prime Supply a little over, I think it was only 1.5 years. So I, I already explained the position I got myself into, but one point that is very interesting to analyze in retrospect is that business had not crossed my mind nor interested me. I was obviously a great worker with massive potential, but I did not know that I would get into business and be self-employed. But now I'm 19 and about to get married. The dilemmas I started to face were a bit more serious, right? So it's one thing when you're a teenager, you're getting a decent paycheck, you're coming home 7, 8 p.m., working like a dog, great. Great discipline, great, you know, great building on potential. I'm getting a little older now, I'm, I'm 19, gonna be 20 soon, I'm getting married. Stuff is getting real. One, I need a bigger paycheck to support a wife and bills. Until now, I was living at my parents' house. But now that I was getting married, that meant needing money for additional things like rent, groceries, utilities, all of a sudden, a seven to $800 paycheck was not going to cut it. The rent in my town alone, right, anyone who knows Muncie, you we're talking $1,100 a month for a studio or a one bedroom. You want anything decent, you're paying $1,500, $2,000, easy. And number two, the, the whole idea of leaving town every day and driving one to two hours just for work started to annoy me a bit. On top of that, I had some friends that were constantly talking about business and business ventures. So I'm 18, 19 years old, about to get married. My friends who are, most of them, all older than me, talking about business. It just, business was not my thing. I just never even thought about it. One of the first ideas that were seriously brought to the table was starting an online Amazon business. This is where people make a business out of selling as a third-party seller on Amazon. We knew at the time that there were a lot of people doing it and that there's plenty of room for more. We also knew that the sky's the limit. There are third-party Amazon sellers that do hundreds of millions of dollars in sales a year. And another factor that we knew was that we do not need a lot of money to get started, right? Technically, you could just start with one item. I liked the idea. I naturally possessed the computer and English skills to manage that aspect. My partner who brought the idea forth had a little bit of business experience, so he was to cover that part. But of course, the only piece missing was the money. We were off looking for an investor. That didn't take long, and we found someone who agreed to invest a minuscule sum of money. In the meantime, I got married in August of 2012. I gave my employer, which was Prime Supply, notice that after I got, I'd get married, I was not going to return, and that and that is exactly what happened. Next thing you know, I'm local. Still looking for a job because, you know, starting a new venture, there's no income, there's no significant investor, there's no, there's nothing, you know. It's a cool, it's a cool idea. I'm getting into business. I'm a teenager, reaching, you know, reaching, you know, my 20s perhaps, but I need a job. I started working for my mother as a cook in a kitchen. My mother, owner of Michika's Kosher Catering, I found myself a job in a kitchen. I was working as a cook, all the while starting to build my Amazon business on the side. This was the beginning of my journey into the business world. I mean, you just experienced me as a teenager getting past some of the addictions, the laziness, all that stuff, all of a sudden becoming an adult, realizing that there's bigger responsibilities than I had scoped out in the past, or I had imagined, this was the beginning of my journey into the business world. I had just turned 20, got married, and going into business while holding down a full-time job. So we began selling on Amazon in the kitchen of my partner's one-bedroom apartment. One thing became apparent to me right away as we went into business is that although I was never into business before, I had great organizational skills, along with a head for business. I was discovering abilities that I had, which I did not even know about. I mean, needless to say, the way that we grew up, th there's no way that I would be 
self-aware of these mental faculties. They existed, they're there. Humans walk around with endless potential. If you are not made aware of them, if you are not properly educated about them or understand how to use them, Kalem tools, they could be there, but you just simply don't recognize them. You don't see them. So in the Amazon business, we, we dealt carefully, decided to choose and stick to one industry instead of running after deals. We happened to have chosen the baby line and started selling baby essentials. But of course, then we feel like Amazon isn't enough because if we're already purchasing products, why not sell it on every platform at least possible, like Amazon, uh, eBay, uh, Sears, and all these other things. And we would be able to do that by utilizing a multi-channel fulfillment software like Channel Advisor. The Amazon company that we built, to a certain degree, was an instant success. We outgrew the kitchen, moved into a one-car garage, our first year in business with less than... 10 grand invested total, did over $200,000 in gross sales, right? So in this little kitchen, starting off with a couple thousand dollar investment, we did 200 gross, outgrew the kitchen. So great, you know, it's, it's really working well. Now, let me just reflect back on how I felt then. So now I'm, I'm 21 years old and I still don't feel like an entrepreneur. Yes, I feel like I'm trying really hard to make money and to make my business succeed, enough that I can, I can completely be self-employed, but I didn't see myself as someone with abnormal abilities in the business world. I just still felt like somebody who's just struggling. And by the way, you know, 200 gross, a married person living in Rockland County doesn't survive under 60, 70, 80 K a year. So 200 gross, very nice. But if you understand the profit margins within the third party selling arena, you would understand that there's no room for a significant paycheck. So you could be doing great. Yeah, you're doing a million dollars in sales. How much can you practically cut off, shave off for a paycheck? Well, that's where things get tricky, but I'm not here to talk about this industry or business in that sense. Another year went by and we outgrew our one car garage. So we moved into a two car garage, right? We're talking 485 square feet, boxes stuffed from floor to ceiling. <laughs> No, no, no AC, no heating. I mean, we're talking about in the winter, freezing cold. We installed a, a wood stove oven, got a dump, had a dump, a wood dump. We would fire up the oven every day, crank out probably 1,500 BTUs. I don't even know. And we're talking about grueling work, 10 degrees outside. And when it's hot, blowing fans. And by this time, me and my partner were taking a small paycheck. I quit my full-time cooking job, but I was still stuck having to do a lot of part-time work to survive and to pay my bills. Me and a couple of my buddies were doing so much part-time work that we opened up a WhatsApp group called Part-Time Kings. And we had certain contacts with certain companies that would throw us these side jobs. And we would just put the information on the group and anyone who was available will just snatch it up. Hey, driver needed for three hours, 100 bucks, blah, blah, blah. And whoever's available and wants to make that couple bucks, we would, we would go for it. I'm talking about like hour to hour gigs. Anything from driving, moving, waitering, and anything in between. I was and transitioned into the, you know being a happily self-employed, but I had to rely on outside work to survive. I actually knew at the time that this idea itself, this whole part-time King's idea could be scaled up and turned into a business of its own within the community where you, where you could offer your services to all the local companies. You put together a database of individuals and you send out an alert when a company needs urgent help. They pay a higher price because, for example, if, you have, if you're a delivery company and a driver falls short and you need a fill-in, you're going to have to, you're gonna pay more than the, the regular hourly rate because it's, it's urgent. And then you have these people who do work like me who could just jump in and do it. So I knew that this was, this was something that could be scaled up and turned into an actual business of its own. This was a little display of the beginning of my natural entrepreneurial cleverness. I mean, I'm just kind of, I'm trying to analyze myself, my own psyche. Like, at which point did I start thinking in such terms of solving issues, of creating ideas and businesses and solutions to make my own money? In general, having the ability to choose whether to work or not was the most liberating feeling for me. I was able to build my business and pay my bills at the same time. It was not easy, but it worked. Being out there and involved in the business world 
started turning me into a different breed, though, especially this part-time king's mentality. The outlook quickly shifted into something like this. We can do anything for the right price. This outlook also began to kind of shave away any of the barriers that me or we as humans naturally put up for ourselves. Whether it was my mother asking me if I can build a ramp for her loading dock or a local school needing a desk picked up and delivered, we did it all. But that wasn't the only way I made money. I became a commission freak. And this is standard business mentality. If someone called me for something or if I heard someone was looking for a particular service, I would make the connection, be the broker, and throw a small percentage on top of it. Right? This is not something that, that I was taught. This is not something I learned. I didn't watch a YouTube video to learn to, to build this mentality. This is something that was inside of me and, and just started coming out naturally. Gradually, my mind began to naturally think of every way to make a buck in order to be able to pay my bills. It is true that my methods at first were small-minded, but one can only do what is within one's understanding and capabilities at the time. Another year went by and we outgrew our two-car two -car garage, right? This time we wanted something that would last a bit longer, so we moved into a 5,000 square foot warehouse. Our sales the second year was in the area of a half a million. At that point, we had two secretaries working for us, but me and my partner were still the ones doing the physical work, literally packaging, shipping out, and doing that stuff. At this point of this journey, I'm about 22 years old, right? Two years went by. I'm slowing down more and more with the part-time work and getting really more and more into my own business. And I guess I could just say overall, getting more comfortable just working for myself and realizing, or what it seemed then, realizing my dreams. And that was a dream, being, being able to be self-employed and working for myself, having my own schedule, nobody on top of me, annoying me. That was a huge dream, and I was reaching it at 22 years old. I had at least enough cleverness to make money to stay busy without having to have a full-time job or, or being under someone's wing. So what I've explained up until now was basically the course of action, or you could say everything that I went through between the ages of 17 and 22. But I've yet to touch on the most important part, the mind. I just gave you a very brief history of the past few years that you'll be able to place a time and setting to the details that I describe below. Because what I conquered physically is one wonder, right? It's one wow. How I did it mentally is a whole different ballgame. What I mentioned till now may come across as being pretty simple and easy or mediocre, but that is far from the truth. More than 95% of people who start online businesses fail within the first year. What I did with the amount of money that I did it with is less than 1% of this planet. Or shall I say what me and my partner did, what we accomplished. Did I mention that I worked 17 hours a day? Did I touch on the fact that my wife was pregnant and me having to take her to doctors weekly and moving into a bigger apartment? Did I talk about the hundreds of other things going on in my life while this company is being built? I did not. And I don't think I need to unless I'm trying to make excuses. It doesn't matter what I was dealing with in life. People who are focused, organized, and well-grounded succeed. While those who are not, while those who are not will use their daily struggles as an excuse for why they are not successful. I don't have excuses. I have and live success, and this is how I do it. It all started out when I was 17. Let's go back again. I made the decision to go work and straighten out my life. That decision alone, when I could have just bummed around for another 10 years, means that I had a good natural sense to make the right decisions despite my freedom to do what I wanted, right? No. I had no authority at 17. We, I won't go there now. I had no authority much younger, but at 17, I definitely had no authority. I made those decisions despite being free, messing around with, uh, with different substances and drugs and getting high and all kinds of different stuff. Then, once I was already working at 18, I felt the need to work out and push myself harder. Not only that, I then start a push-up and pull-up routine. Why? Because I'm naturally wanting to excel but I don't know how or where, right? Because I don't have, I don't have that, I, I'm not grounded in that sense. I wasn't, I wasn't guided, I wasn't educated. So I have this drive, this fire that's burning inside of me, but I didn't know what to do with it. In other words, my mind wants or wanted more than the average person's, but I know nothing about business, so I had nowhere to channel my energy. 
what I did have was a physical job, and so I worked out on top of my physical work in order to excel and succeed in my position. One year later, at 19, I get fed up with traveling and working for others. I notice that working for others makes me a slave, which, by the way, I'm not saying that this is the case for everyone, because I was very liberated and happy working at Prime Supply. It was during a very good time in my personal life. But I was still a slave in the sense that I could not do what I wanted. If I had a wedding one night and I wanted to sleep late, I could not come in late. If things come up urgently, I, I felt too bad to miss work. These are examples of what made me feel like a slave. I naturally had an issue with it, and I felt the need to escape it. It is woven into my fabric to be independent. I make the best decisions when I'm free. It was always like that for me growing up, and that's not the case for everyone. I'm just kind of sharing a little bit of a reflection of, of my personality and, and my life and the stuff that I did. At 20, I began my first online business. I know nothing about business or the online world. I naturally had no fear. I began to learn the industry. I research, I learn, I try things and succeed. Sometimes I fail. I'm a hustler as well because I'm literally holding down a full-time job in order to continue to build my company with hopes of being self-employed. Nothing deters me. I continue to climb the ladder. At 21, I stop working for others altogether, and I take on the yoke of having to fend for my own paycheck. Through part-time work and a small paycheck in my own company, I survive and continue to sharpen my skills in the business world. At 22, I stop taking part-time jobs and replace that with services that I can personally offer others. At this point, I'm 100% self-employed. What insight do we gain out of all of these details? Here's the answer. That entrepreneurs are born and not made. Yes, the work and experience that I had definitely enabled me to keep building. But nobody forced me or coerced me into making the decisions that I made. I naturally made the right decisions. I naturally have motivation. I'm not lazy. Ideas come to me. Clarity, understanding, and decisive decision-making are gifts that I was born with. I didn't realize this until I was older and realized it, cliche, but it was there waiting to bloom. I'm not patting myself on my shoulder or trying to relay any level of ego whatsoever. I'm just trying to be honest and straight with regards to a very, I guess you could say when you get to this level of it, th this, this point in the topic, it could be very sensitive for people. I'm trying to look unbiasedly in retrospect what happened over the past seven years to me. And this is what I'm sharing with you. But what about the individuals to whom it does not come naturally to? Where does that leave them? Well, they have a gift as well. And that's called desire. The fact that you may be listening to this episode or have gotten this far means that you are either a born entrepreneur or you are continuously expanding your horizon, which, by the way, is natural for a born entrepreneur to do. Or you're not, but you have the desire to learn and implement. Further in this series, we're going to explore how we can utilize our desire in order to become a self-made entrepreneur. If entrepreneuring does not come naturally to you, then you are stuck with desire alone. But don't be let down. Desire is one of the most powerful forces in this universe. You can learn about desire. Rabbi Nachman has certain teachings about desire. I mean, I don't want to get into desire from a spiritual standpoint, but anyone who knows knows that desire ultimately is one of the highest things you could have. Arguably, the only thing you really do have in the sense of how it overlaps with free will. So when we apply desire to business, it's nothing to take lightly. Desire is a huge thing. In fact, I'll take it even a step further. You know what the underlying difference between a born and a made entrepreneur is? Desire. Born entrepreneurs have all kinds of desire naturally, and thus, they are filled with all of these other qualities as a result of their desire. The only element that the made entrepreneur lacks is desire. Without desire, one has nothing. It is desire that motivates us to do all things. Without it, we are couch potatoes. So wait a minute. Both the born and the unborn entrepreneurs are stuck with desire? Yes. But again... Born entrepreneurs don't have to struggle with lacking desire nearly as much. I won't say at all, because that would be incorrect. We, born entrepreneurs, have to continuously reignite our desire 
but we do so naturally. What comes to the born entrepreneur naturally must be learned and implemented by the unborn. The good news, though, is that it can be done. How? Well, just like all things in life, it begins with the education or realization, decision, and consequently the commitment. You have to go the, through these stages of educating yourself, making the decision, and consequently uh, committing. We're going to talk about all of that. After you educate yourself, realize or have an epiphany, you have to make a big decision that you will start and not stop. You have to firmly establish in your mind that you will mimic entrepreneurial habits, which the first one being never give up. Born entrepreneurs don't give up. They don't have to be told not to give up. They just simply don't. That concept doesn't exist in their nature, which is why they are who they are. If you are not that, you must learn from that and implement the same behavior. Become a copycat. However hard and unnatural it is to you, don't give up. Here's the ironic paradox. Think about this clearly. You could get around it, but it is a paradox nonetheless, and I want to just voice it because I don't want to feel like I missed anything or I'm kind of glossing over anything. The answer to the question that I mentioned earlier about entrepreneurs being born or made is an ironic paradox of its own. Why? Technically, entrepreneurs can be born or made, as we can see from history and people's testimonials. So what's the paradox? The ironic paradox is that most individuals who are not born an entrepreneur will not become one, even though they have the ability to. Why? Because it doesn't come naturally to them, which means that they will naturally give up after a while of dealing with difficulties. That's why it's so ironic, because although theoretically they can, most will not succeed in realizing their hopes and desires. This is exactly why I'm focusing on the two most important elements, desire and never give up. Desire is what continues to motivate. These are, these, are, these are tools. Desire is what continues to motivate. Never give up is what weathers all the storms. If you cannot find it within yourself to muster up those two qualities, then I don't think this league is for you. After all, everyone has a place in this world, and you definitely don't want to waste half your life trying to become something that you're not. Spiritually speaking, and this is why I said there's a huge overlapping surface in decision-making and in business and contemplation and in, in general and entrepreneurial outlook, understanding. Our sages, our wise men of the past teach us that everyone has a place in this world. If your two hands are amputated, you're probably not supposed to be a piano player. If your legs get chopped off, you're probably not supposed to run the marathon. We live in a funny world where, I don't want to get into it, it's more on the political spectrum, where everybody wants to do and be anything, but spiritually, that's not sound, that's not good, it's not beneficial. Every person has a tafkit, every person has a tikkun, something they're supposed to be, something they're supposed to complete, something that they are, and we believe that through life, nature, and all that happens to you, Hashem is guiding you to your, to your place, to your destination. So, yes, anyone can be anything if you struggle with yourself hard enough, but not everybody should be everything. So if you're smart enough to ponder whether you want to venture down the journey in a life of business and being a business owner and an entrepreneur, think clearly. There's no, there's no harm, there's no foul in really taking the time to think through it. It's not for everyone. As I mentioned in the beginning of this podcast, not every business owner is an entrepreneur. You can still go into business, though, own a company, and not be an entrepreneur. They are not and do not have to be synonymous. When I talk about being an entrepreneur, I'm not talking about, I'm not referring to the Google definition of it. I'm talking about the individuals who exceed and go beyond the average business owner, the ones who are always coming up with new ideas of how to expand their business or industry how to optimize and how to incorporate new ideas and technology for more effective solutions. I'm talking about the business owner who handles their dealings and struggles with ease. Believe it or not, there are plenty of business owners who just focus on maintaining and have no desire to become bigger, better, faster. These are not individuals who I consider to be entrepreneurs. But if your desire is burning strong to be part of the elite, then the door is open. 
Nothing is stopping you other than your mental struggles. Follow the advice of those living it and you will succeed. Deviate and give up and you will not succeed. One plus one equals two. I know it almost sounds harsh. It almost sounds, oh, there has to be more to it, but no. This podcast is about business and in business, we don't play around. In business, we tell it how it is. And if you're going to enter business, you're going to enter the business world, you better be ready for the sharks, for the lions. Because if you, it's not for the faint of heart. If you don't have what it takes internally, you'll be torn apart. Easy. This was just part one. Stay tuned for part two, three, four, and I don't know until I'm done yapping about it. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, God bless you.